is, are these shows just a little bit dull, a little bit boring and uninspiring, maybe? What you mean is a bit desperate, is what maybe. you mean? Maybe desperate. Hello, I'm Matt Wilkinson, Royal Editor of The Sun Newspaper, and welcome to our show, Royal Exclusive. This week, delving into the Royal News is best-selling author and Royal expert, its friend of the show, it's Ingrid Seward. Hello, Ingrid. Hello. Welcome back. You were here on a very early episode of, of this show, but now we've got a much nicer studio, so I thought we'd invite you back and show off. Well, we're in a very glamorous studio today, so I'm feeling very honoured to be here. Excellent. You're looking very glamorous as well, so you're Thank fitting you. in very well. Now, look, hot off the presses, um, as we sit down, we're, we're, we're finally told that Harry and Meghan's new uh, television projects with Netflix, because obviously we've not seen them on uh, part of this, you know, £100 million Netflix deal. They haven't seemed to have done anything for such a long time. Um, Harry's going to do a polo show. Uh, he's going to talk about the, or he's going to appear in a show about about polo, the event, the the social scene, and Megan's going to be doing a, a gardening and lifestyle uh, cookery uh, show. This is a, a massive change from what we've seen before with the couple on on Netflix, where they you know had their documentary slagging off members of the royal family. This time they seem to be opening the, the doors to their life, or opening the doors to their new kind of post royal life and, and what's going on in California. Is anyone going to watch it? Do you think? Well, I think Harry's polo could be really interesting. I don't know how long it would last. It's a strange choice, though, isn't it? Because, as I say, previously it was all about Megxit. It was all about their, their bitter dispute with the royal family. That's, what, that's how they signed this, this mega deal with Netflix. It's a royal sport, so it will still be a kind of glimpse into how the rich and famous and members of the royal family spend their time. You know, there's a big clique of people that are fans of polo, but it is quite elitist, I think. Mm. Um, that's the problem. I, not, I, I think they might gather viewers in the first one because it'll be curiosity, but I don't know how it would run on. That would be up to how good Harry is. Because mm. we would expect, or we've spoken about this in the past, that uh, previous members of the royal family, such as Edward, when he started his TV company, etc., people really just want members of the royal family, if they've got a TV show, to talk about the royal family. If he was to do a polo show, do you think that could be avoided? Uh, would people still demand that he would he would speak about his family rather than just polo? Well, if he's clever, he could drop a few remarks in like, oh, Pa used to do this, or, uh, or, or you know, William used to tease me about that. If he's clever, he, he'd have to sprinkle it very lightly. I think, I mean, he's, he's quite good on television, Harry, when he's not grumpy. When, I, think, I think, yeah, I think people will be really interested and I think he could hold it together because anyone's going to talk to him, anyone that's interesting is going to talk to him. Um, but it, it, it depends how it's scripted, it depends how good he is. There's a lot on his shoulders to make it work. Now, there's two shows, obviously. Um, Harry's polo show and, uh, and Meghan's. Shall I read you how they describe yes. Meghan's Netflix show? OK. So they are saying that it's um, that this first series is cu curated by Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, will celebrate the joys of cooking and gardening, entertaining and friendship. <laughs> the friendship thing stands out to me because she loses a lot of friends over... She you know, changes over the friends years. very quickly. <laughs> Um, cooking, well, there's so many people doing cooking shows, but I think you know, she, she's always talked about food, Megan, in, in, from the very, very early days when she had the, the, that, uh, the TIG, wasn't it, her website. Um, I think I would be interested. It would be very American cooking, obviously. Um, but I, I think gardening, I can't see her gardening. But to maybe, maybe she'll be gardening in couture outfits. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm a little bit more sceptical about that because there's so many people doing that kind of thing. So definitely, to begin with, she's going to get. They're going to get massive viewership. Maybe that's all Netflix care about is to get a great opening couple of shows because people will be intrigued, and then uh, and then you know if it drops off, it drops off. Is this the progressive new role that we were told that that they were leaving the royal family for? Uh, you know, Archetypes has, has failed. 
um, her Spotify show, you know, that that's been yes. dropped. Um, she put a show or tried to get a show called Pearl on Netflix about um, about an inspiring young woman, I think it was. That that didn't materialise. Would we expect more from, from Meghan and Harry? Because they had so much ambition when they were in the royal family. They were, you know, Meghan was... was, was allegedly contacting her aides at five o'clock in the morning with new ideas and new ideas. Is, are these shows just a little bit dull, a little bit boring and uninspiring, maybe? What you mean is a bit desperate. Is what maybe. You, maybe desperate. I don't know. I think, we, I think it would be uh, wrong to criticise it before we've seen it. I am more sceptical about Meghan because I don't know that she knew anything about gardening and we've got a lot of experts on gardening. Is this California gardening, English gardening? Um, and as for her talking about friendship, well, I'm afraid that does make me feel a bit sort of sceptical because she is really known for losing friends rather than gaining friends. So to hear her uh, talking about friendships, I, I think that might go down a, a little strangely. Mm. Well, it seems to be the avenue they're going to kind of market themselves as a, you know, a, a kind of carefree Californian uh, family living their, living their best life. Um, they're definitely changing tax from criticising the royal family. Um, but I just wonder whether, whether you think it will be as successful, say, as, the, as their big Netflix show they had last year. Well, I think the big Netflix show they had last year, every, well, anyone that was interested tuned in to watch because we were so riveted. And it was a sort of inside, insider's view. This is obviously... I don't think Megan will be cooking in her own kitchen. Um, I, I don't know what else they, they can do, Matt. As you said, they haven't actually had a great success so far, apart from, obviously, from Harry's book. You can't say that wasn't a success, whatever you thought about it. It was a huge success. And I still think in my heart that that's probably where Meghan will make the most money, as if she... I'm sure it's in the pipeline. They've still got to produce books. Um, I, I, I don't know what... I, I mean, a lot of members of the royal family have tried to work in television, as you said about Edward, and Peter Phillips has too, but he's not... You know, he's not a working member of the royal family, never has been. Um, I think Meghan is far enough removed from it for, it for it possibly to work. She'll get a lot of criticism. Everything she does will be criticised. But um, as long as people remain interested, what does that matter? I'm sure we'll be tuning in. I just think we will be. Unfortunately. Um, so, a uh, big Royal event this week. I'm not talking about your book launch, which was a lot of fun. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Of course. Um, but it was uh, the King and Queen's 19th wedding anniversary, um, which is quite remarkable, really, when you think about it. There's, you know, it was a low-key event. I think they just they were at home, um, went up to Balmoral later in the week. But what's been the success? What's the secret of the success between... King and Queen for having such a, a... what seems to be like a very successful marriage? Just briefly, I think, what I would... The first thing that would come into my head would be laughter. I mean, Charles used to look so miserable when he was married to the gorgeous Diana. How could a man look so miserable married to someone so beautiful and lovely? But he was obviously very unhappy. Um, he just looked so happy around Queen Camilla. And you can tell that she's sort of giving him a, a backbone. She is really a glass half full and he is a glass half empty. And she said that. And she makes him laugh. Clarence House is a really happy place, full of laughter, a little bit chaotic. Um, just, I think that they really have a laugh. And I think being, well, I know that being royal is really separates you from the rest of the world it's a very lonely place to be and if you have someone that you're not getting on with it's even more difficult but Camilla um, makes Charles laugh and also if you think right back she's so supportive of him and she's she praises him all the time darling you wonderful your speech was wonderful um, and he needs that because in his youth he never had that so and in his dotage, I suppose you could say. He's really being praised and you can see how happy he is when he's meeting the crowds. I never seen Charles look so joyous as he was over the Easter weekend, shaking hands, smiling, and every sort of walkabout he's done since he became king, he's been, a, you know, he looks a really happy man, despite the fact that he's obviously not, his health is, isn't that great at the moment. You know, you knew Princess Diana. 
you used to go to Kensington Palace, obviously, to have cups of tea and have a chat with her. Um, you obviously have a lot of affection for, for Diana. But why do you think this, this marriage, you know, say 19 years, is, is a great achievement? Why do you think this has lasted so much longer or been more successful than, than, than his marriage to Diana? Well, the thing that with Charles and Diana's marriage is that they were at loggerheads with each other and they were both vying for top spot. Certainly in the beginning, Charles used to get very, very... I mean, ask Arthur Edwards from The Sun. He was there right from the beginning. Charles used to get very jealous. As he probably wouldn't use that word, but envious of the fact that everybody wanted to see his wife. And he was like an also-ran. Um, and I think that... Uh, a lot of their marriage was like that. And Diana was, it was a mismatch. She was, she was looking for something that wasn't there in him. And even after they had William and Harry, um, she said that her, they had a real brief period of happiness before she had Harry. And then, and, and also she had this sort of specter of Camilla in her head the whole time and she was obsessed with it. And that yet, when I last spoke to her, shortly before her death, I was very brave. I, anyhow, I bought the subject of Camilla up. And she said, oh, it wasn't Camilla that ruined our marriage. And I thought, what? I don't believe what I'm hearing. She said, oh, it wasn't Camilla. It was the people around my husband. And I thought, it wasn't Camilla. And you've been complaining, and complaining about Camilla all these years. But she changed tack and decided that it was the environment in which keeping a royal marriage together you've got to be very strong and probably far more mature than she was. These just about talking about keeping the relationship strong. While, yeah, they've gone up to Balmoral, they've gone up to Burke Hall for, for a week or so to kind of relax, Camilla's definitely stepped up. And it, she's now doing... Um, you know, she's now, she's now the Prince Philip role. You know, she's now the, the, the strength and stay of, of the king. Um, and she's... When the late queen was unwell, Pr uh, Prince Charles, as he was then, would, would step in and be the kind of lead of the royal family. But now it's Camilla is the, uh, is, is the person that, would, that stands in for the, for, the, for the king. What do you think about that? Do you think that's... Uh, do you, 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 you're glad that Camilla is now the kind of the main focal point of the royal family when the king's not there? She, was all, she, she led them into uh, uh, King Constantine's memorial service because, uh, obviously, uh, King Charles... Couldn't, was unable to go to that because the doctor said you've got to you know, keep away from people. But it was different on Easter Sunday. And I think people really respect Camilla because she was 50 when she got into this family. She's now 76. And it is, it's, it's, unless you were born to it, it's quite hard. And they have huge, the Windsors have massive energy. Charles, as a young man, used to run everywhere up and down the corridors. Prince Philip used to run everywhere and jump down all those staircases to just because they were in such big buildings to get there quicker. Camilla doesn't have that kind of energy and I think it really takes it out of her. And I think people respect her for what she's done. Do we know, um, I was thinking about the, the, the crown. Um, do you remember the, the pet names they have for each other? Charles and Camilla? Yeah. Well, they were called Fred and Gladys. Oh, that was yeah, yeah that was years ago. Yeah. I, I, when people have nicknames, they usually change, don't they? Different phases. I mean, we know that that uh, Harry is H, and we know that Meghan is Meg, but there could be lots of other things. And I do remember, I can't remember what Prince William was. Big Willie, I think, <laughs> according to the news of the world. I think that's. I think that's. And Kate was Babykins, yeah. but people change the nicknames over time. So I don't know what Charles and Camilla call each other now. Darling, I think. I think so. I mean, it's still a really strong relationship. So. And here, Charles says, says it's very nice when he says, my beloved wife, as he used to say with the Queen, my beloved mother. Absolutely. Shall we take a little romp through the royal relationships, good or bad, that yes, are happening at the absolutely. moment? Yes, um, absolutely. William and Catherine. We haven't seen them for a while, uh, justifiably, because Catherine, obviously, you know, recovering from, from cancer. How the last couple of months have been incredibly stressful for the Prince and Princess of Wales. Um, they have a very strong couple. How do you think they will be coping right now? I think what, what the Prince and Prince of Wales are doing right now um, is just concentrating on their family life. Um, the children go back to school next week. Um, we are gonna, uh, we probably will see Kate driving them to, to school, possibly. Um, I think that they people are just waiting to see her again. But I think... When you see William and Kate together, they have a great relationship. They, they, they're quite touchy-feely, but not 
over touchy feely like Meghan and Harry are. They don't cling to each other, but occasionally they they do, and they laugh to, again. I think it's laughter. They laugh together a lot, um, and I think that William is very very supportive of his wife. And I know that Carol Middleton has said that to friends. Um, he, he is so supportive of my daughter, and she's very sort of proud of proud of him. So you know, it's it's. It's that mutual support they have with each other. Are you surprised that there was a YouGov poll, I think, this week, um, that dis despite all the furore around the, the Mother's Day photograph, that the Prince and Princess of Wales are still the two most popular members of the royal family? I mean, they're not without their crises. Remember a couple of years ago, the um, Caribbean tour, you know, which I was on, was an absolute PR disaster. They're not without their problems. What, what is it about their, you know, you talk about them being warm and that they are very, you know, um, affectionate to each other in private and public. Um, what is it about their relationship that really strikes a chord with the public? I think it's the warmth between them and the warmth that they, they you know, it's not fake. It's when they give out warmth. And of course, uh, Kate is a photographer's dream. She's so beautiful. And William's a very good looking uh, young man. And I think that... Uh, it's it's natural. It's not. You see, with with Megan, uh, I feel it's she's got one expression, the, the big grin, um, and I feel that's all, and that doesn't feel natural. But with Kate and William, they've got all. It's just a warmth they have, and it it sort of exudes to everybody around them, which is what the magic that Diana had. However nervous Diana was about meeting people or going out on her own. The minute she was out there, she exuded this warmth and friendliness, and, and that's what Kate and William do. Now, a less functional or a more dysfunctional royal relationship is uh, Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson. Obviously, they married in the 80s, um, divorced, now living together and basically, you know, supporting each other through, through thick and thin. Did you ever have, have much dealings personally with, with, with Andrew and, and Sarah? I had a lot of dealings with Sarah because I wrote a book about her. And I knew Sarah before she was, uh, became the Duchess of York. Um, she's very loyal. She's extremely loyal to Andrew. And I do think she found, certainly in the early years of her marriage, she found this um, arrogance that he has. You know, don't you know who I am? Entitlement. I think she found that very difficult. She loved him, but I think she found that side of it difficult because she's another warm, friendly person, probably too friendly sometimes. And I, th But she's remained very loyal. I, I feel, and I don't know this, that she must have talked to the Queen and the Queen must have said, please look after Andrew for me. Or, yeah, and I absolutely feel that. Uh, and that's what she's going to do. I don't think she'll leave him. I don't think they'll get married again. And I think... She is, you know, really trying to move on and make money and work in the area that she's interested in, which is film and television. Um, she hasn't been hugely successful, but she's been pretty successful. She's made a lot of money out of her books. Um, but she's, the, she's really, you know, we all look at her as a sort of money earner. But I think that's what she wants to do. And she can quite happily work from Royal Lodge. It's not a bad place to live probably rent-free. And the only thing you've got to do is look after her husband, well, her ex-husband. Well, I mean, it's, it's a diff it's a, it's an interesting relationship. It is. Do you think perhaps you mentioned about loyal? Would it be wrong for me to say that she's too loyal? After everything that's happened with Epstein and everything that's happened well, with... Well, she's not going to walk out on him. He, remember, he supported her when she was really in trouble over all the various scandals and things she's been involved in. He supported her, so it wouldn't look too good if she kind of walked out on him, and she wouldn't. She just wouldn't. I don't think she's too loyal. I think it's just a, a really lovely character trait. I often, I've, over the years, I've had quite a few tips from, from or people suggesting that they might remarry. Uh, you, earlier, you, 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 you would rule that out. I can't see the point of them remarrying, unless it's for tax reasons. <laughs> I mean, I really don't see the point. I think if something works the way it is, d don't muck with it. I mean, maybe their, their daughters would like them to remarry. I don't know. But uh, I think that probably Fergie is better off being her own person. She doesn't... She's still the Sarah, Duchess of York. She doesn't need the HRH. Everybody knows who she is. They either like her or they don't. And I don't see that there's anything 
that she would make life better for either of them if they got remarried. So when you used to speak to her, what, 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 how would, would she talk much about Andrew? Would she talk about yes, what kind of she, guy he was? Or? Yes, she did. I mean, I, I used to know her very well. Um, yes, she did talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... Well, of course, he hasn't got into all this trouble then. I, um, I think she's very protective of him now because, you know, he needs protecting. But I, I don't... I don't... I think she... Well, she always says, I don't want to talk about it that and quite rightly so what can she say she can only make it worse by stirring things up i think she's absolutely right to keep her mouth shut about it fine now uh, one couple that doesn't get talked about as much as the others we've discussed today um and we had some comments on on, on youtube last week saying well there are uh, edward and sophie duke and duchess of edinburgh are a very successful partnership they are it's 25 years this year they'll be celebrating their anniversary um, why has that marriage succeeded, whereas others have, have ended in divorce? What is it about Edward and Sophie and, the, and their relationship? Because um, they're popular, but we don't see them very much. Well, I think they've become more popular recently because we've seen much more of them. Um, Sophie was always, you know, a wonderful photograph, beautiful, lovely face and, you know, doing worthy, worthy things. And she's given quite a lot of interviews and uh, she seems such a, a very special lady. And I met her when she first appeared on the scene and she was always incredibly friendly. Difficult for... It was difficult for her because, you know, there are a lot of people saying, well, you know, she's very ordinary, her father's a car salesman, which wasn't true, and her mother takes in typing or something. It was quite cruel, um, but it wasn't true. Her father's a lovely, lovely person. Um, and I just think that they've kind of worked it through. And they and Sophie's so nice about Edward. She said some lovely things the other day about him. And that they, they they have their own lives, but they come together. I mean, I know they're both very busy and they but they always try and have one of them at home when the other one is travelling. The um the, they were obviously at uh, the Entente Cordiale, the 120 years at, at, at Buckingham Palace, where we had French troops at Buckingham Palace, which raised a few eyebrows up. But, you know, we're living in peace now with France and it's absolutely fantastic. But there is such a um, a, a large amount of, of the population that, that want to see more of Edward and, Edward and Sophie. Well, I think Edward and Sophie would be absolutely delighted uh, to be more high profile. Well, they are definitely more high profile now. They're still a sort of youngish couple. Um, who who are very good and they, you know, I think Edward's got much warmer. I mean, he could be a bit sort of dull and, and cold in, in public um, and didn't always want to shake hands. But now he seems to be much warmer. I think it's because he's getting enthusiasm from the, the crowd that he's talking to. And there's a, there's a there's space for them now. Duke and well, Duchess exactly. of Sussex aren't there. Yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's room for a, for, a, for a couple to... You know, well, it, it went, when, when Harry and Meghan were around, there was two really high-profile couples and, and the King, or there was Prince of Wales then, um, and no-one else really got a look at it. There, was, there wasn't room for them then. When it, it was the Queen, the Prince of Wales, and then the, you know, the Prince of Wales' children. Um, and Edward and Sophie never really got a look in. They did plenty of things, but no-one was that interested. Mm. Now... They're higher profile, they're more visible, and they're doing more. Talking of Harry and Meghan, again, back to the beginning, Duke and Duchess of Sussex, how do you see this uh, marriage playing out? Because when... Obviously, there was a huge amount of stress when they moved to America and there was constant, you know, rumours that maybe it might not work out. But they're still going strong. You know, we, we say we spoke earlier about they, they've still got uh, plans that they're both working on for new Netflix shows, so they've still got ideas. Um, are you surprised that um, you know, the naysayers have been proved wrong, that they that the marriage still is... They, they still are together and they still are living in California? And how do you see this marriage plan? Will we have a 25th wedding anniversary or a 19th uh, wedding anniversary as we do with the King and Queen, with, with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex? I really don't know that. But, I mean, everyone said, oh, this marriage isn't going to last. You're right, they did. But you know, Matt, you know a little bit about this because you've been out in California. I, I, I think, my opinion, and I think I'm still... I think Harry has, has got an obsessive love for Meghan. And I, I don't think he would ever, ever leave her. I, I, and, you know, she's, she's 
in control. And as long as she remains in control, I think she's happy. So I think the marriage is probably, I think they're very happy. And who wouldn't be happy living in that gorgeous house? As that, you know, they've got two lovely children. Um, they don't, I mean, I know they're not popular in this country, but does that really worry them? I don't know. What do you think, Matt? Well, no, you're right. I did go to um, California last summer because there was lots of uh, reports and lots of rumours that, that, you know, there was, there was trouble in paradise. So uh, there was lots of online uh, comments, lots of people on, on Twitter and stuff like that. So we did look into it and all we could fathom out was that the, there were just lots of claims. So it was always the case with rumours, where you hear rumours, but once you actually dig into it, there didn't seem to be any uh, real kind of key source that could, could say Harry was... There's always rumours that Harry was staying in a hotel here. Yes, that was, was very strange, yeah. But, it, but it, it really did snowball and a lot of people were talking about it. So we did... We, I did pop out and have a look and I couldn't really find any evidence of that. And it was pointed out that they have a huge... Um, a huge sprawling mansion with guest houses. So if, the, what, if they did want to live apart, they could just live apart on the uh, on the house. But I found no evidence of them living apart. What I was told was that, just like any kind of normal marriage, they um, have arguments or disagreements about how to bring up the children. Um, yeah. Megan wants to um, the children to have more of a kind of life in California. He wants them to see, wants them to be more visible, whereas the whereas Prince Harry, it's what I was told, was uh, more worried about them getting photographed. Doesn't want them to you know to, to be taken pictures by the paparazzi. Well, Harry is like really paranoid about yeah. that, isn't he? Um, but of course, the sad thing is that, that they they are not getting to know their cousins or their grandfather. They're great. They're yeah. Um, and I think that's very sad. And I, may, I don't know what will happen. But you see, I think that when, the, when Archie is older, he's going he's to want to know his cousins. And they're certainly going to want to know him because he's, he's going to be very glamorous, a really cool Californian kid. And they're desperately going to want to know them and they're, they're going to want to go there and see them. So anything could happen. Do you think... Um, just thinking, we've got uh, the end of May... I think we've got the Invictus ceremony at St Paul's. Um, so it's a 10-year anniversary. Um, that, so I've asked, uh, will, will the Duke and Duchess of Sussex come? And they haven't finalised their plans yet. Um, do you think Harry and Meghan will attend? They could bring their children. That would be quite a, quite a uh, momentous occasion. <laughs> they bring their children for the first time since Platinum Jubilee, get to meet the King and stuff like that. Would you, would, do you think people will welcome them to come for this 10-year an anniversary of Invictus? Um, I think they desperately want Harry there. And, of course, people are fascinated. We haven't seen the children. Well, not certainly over here, we, we haven't seen what the... I think people would be absolutely fascinated. And certainly it would be nice for King Charles to see them. But apparently Harry won't come here unless he's given an absolute guarantee that he's going to have uh, royal security, not just metropolitan police security, royal security, and that... Um, his his business with the Home Office is going to be sorted out. But you can't make demands on, on His Majesty's government like that. So I don't know what will happen. I mean, maybe that's another rumour. Another rumour. Well, but it's, it makes sort of sense, doesn't it? One thing that isn't a rumour, and, you know, if we're talking about uh, royal relationships and, and marriages, one thing that could potentially split people up is Harry's visa row. Um, have you been able to see this week the, um, there was a think tank that managed to persuade the uh, US government to show a judge Prince Harry's visa application? Now, obviously, the argument here is that he is, if, to get a US visa, you have to confess about your drug taking and then you will be refused a US visa if, you, if you've taken lots of drugs. And he's obviously in spare... He is detailed in great detail and interviews as well about his, you know, taking psychedelic drugs, uh, cocaine, smoking cannabis, you know, a long period of his life. This could end up with Donald Trump looking at this visa application or, uh, you know, and, and wondering whether, it, whether, whether Harry should be allowed into the United States. This could potentially blow up in the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's face if there is a visa problem. Well, you're one step ahead of me, Matt, as you always are, of course, and should be. Um, I didn't know that had just come... I mean, I read it, obviously, earlier on, but I didn't know that had just come up again. But if Trump doesn't get in, what can Trump do? Um, I think it's... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I know about the, the drugs and the American visa. 
And the, but Harry's lawyer could say, and I think has said, well, you know, you, you don't believe everything you read in books. He was, you know, he, he, he can blame it. He could blame it on his, his ghostwriter. There's going to be lots of interesting see, ways to see if he can get out of all that that drug business. But maybe he can't. I mean, he could be deported. He could be deported. He could be deported. But who would want to do be responsible for doing that? Um, I. I I, I don't know. It's it's a very interesting case. Well, I say Donald Trump could win at the end. Of, he, could, he could win the. You know, he could become president, and he's already voiced his dislike of of Prince Harry. Yes, I don't think it would be good for Harry and Meghan at all if if Trump became president. But, I mean, he's not going to want to injure the royal family, is he? Really? I mean, I think he's. Well, we know. I think we know he's a lot of mouth and not always much action. Well, thanks very much, Ingrid. Uh, it's a pleasure having you on again. Hopefully, you can come back for a, for a third time on our show. Um, that's all we have time for today. I hope you enjoyed our romp through the good and the bad of the royal family relationships. And if you like this content and you enjoyed it, then please click below, subscribe for, for all the royal news. Thank you for watching.